a couple whose love story should be made into a movie. He survived church and she worked at Hooters. For today's lead singer, Maddie Montgomery and his bride, Candace, today on The Revolution. Welcome to The Revolution, a show with killer music and razor sharp truth. I'm George. And I'm Kat. For today's lead singer, Maddie Montgomery, and his wife share their amazing love story and what God is doing with them as a couple. But first, you need to know a little bit about For Today, Maddie's full time job. They run with a very hardcore group of guys, they tour with hardcore bands all over the nation. But their content is very different compared to the regular hardcore scene. From one of their songs, Seraphim, some of the lyrics, I see an old breed of prophet arising, speaking as voices from another age. Under the name above all names, we declare that the glorious one lives. Mm. Maddie and his guys for today, they're not about religion at all. They believe in the church, capital C, church, that we're called the saints. And they are all about getting that strong message of authority out, the definition and the identity of the church. Whew. Powerful, powerful man of God. But rewind a couple of years ago, and Maddie was just a typical church kid that didn't know who he was and who Jesus was. Maddie, in just a moment, but first, this. <laughs> typical scene today. The young lady lives for the weekends, gets a job at Hooters to afford her coach purses, and then gets invited to church. But she said the experience nearly traumatized her. That's right. And then you have the front man of a band called For Today, who's not your typical Christian band. They travel the hardcore scene. Uh, they preach Jesus everywhere they go. Mm -hmm. They get even cussed out for sharing their faith yep. on stage, yet have a following that just keeps growing and growing and growing. And the lead singer, Maddie Montgomery, he said he wasn't even saved, but yet he called himself a Christian. It wasn't until an experience right after college where he was hitchhiking the whole country where he really came to know Christ. Here's Maddie and Candace Montgomery. People, people always ask me, oh, when did you get saved? You know, what, what happened? And, uh, and I always have to kind of shrug my shoulders and say, I'm saved today. Um, I, I grew up in church and probably would have called myself a Christian for most of my life. But, you know, even, even through that, I had found a way to justify in my own mind a sinful lifestyle of, like, sexual promiscuity and, and drug use and alcohol abuse and, um, you know, a, a lot of, like, selfish um, ambitions and a lot of, like, dark sort of um, secretive addictions. And, uh, and, and in all of that, I, I, the reality was Jesus was not the Lord of my life. Um, but I still, at that point, would have said that he was, and I, and I would have called myself a Christian. Um, and so, uh, you know, more than like one single event, it was like a, a process of hearing the gospel and, and slowly allowing myself to become vulnerable to it and, and softened to it to a point at which I was able to, um, to really take like an honest, introspective look at, at my life and say, here's what God requires of me and here's the life I'm living. And there's a lot of differences between the two. And I need to start like willingly sacrificing and willingly taking steps toward fixing that. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's, there's, I think one story in which the Lord had, had the most profound effect on me. Um, there was a time in college where a friend of mine had, had jokingly sort of uh, planned on quitting our jobs and hitchhiking around the country for a month. And uh, the, the more we joked about it, the more serious it got. Um, and, until finally I had quit my job and was moving out of my apartment and was like, I'm doing this. And the more that my friend had talked about it, the more evident it became to me that he was not going to come with me. Um, and I was kind of everything in me was screaming this is just a stupid idea why would you ever do that it's not that big a deal you can stay here you have a job here you have you know a place to live here you have friends here um, and uh, 
but for some reason there was just this really deep pressing sense of, of destiny over that trip and uh, and so I was like broken and torn over it and didn't know what to do and uh, and I found myself one night um, after I had already quit my job and my boss told me think about it for a couple days if you still want to do it that's cool um, and uh, I found myself on my face in tears saying God I don't even know really anything about you or if you can hear me or if you care to um, but I need to know what to do now because I I don't I don't know what to do uh, and I think that was the first time in my life that I was willing to admit that I was in over my head um, and it was funny because it was such a such a logical decision of course you would never hitchhike around the country that's a stupid thing to do but um, logic went out the window when when destiny came into the picture and uh, and so I went I went to God for the first time and said, I need you to tell me what to do. And within a half an hour, I was reading a book, and the book said, now is the time to wander into homelessness and leading a holy man's life to seek the path of enlightenment. And, and that was the first time. Like, those words just jumped off the page. And for the first time, I had heard the voice of God. And it wasn't about... It wasn't about uh, uh, him being like a hero in, in a book. It wasn't about, you know, this theoretical God concept that we used to study in philosophy. It was, it was about this real being that was really invested in my life and was really making himself known and, and evident to me. Um, and so I did for, for a month. Uh, I hitchhiked all around the country and, and it was such a tremendous thing um, because every single day I was, in, I was in a position in which if God didn't show up miraculously and provide for me, I was hopeless. I, w I would have been lost. Um, I was thousands of miles away from anybody that I knew with, with no money and no way to get back. Uh, but, but every time God would come through and I put myself in a position where I was really relying on him for the first time. Uh, and I think that that was when it took the step for being just a philosophical concept or a set of beliefs to, to a real relationship with this, this God that I had only talked about up until that point. I wasn't raised in a Christian home. Uh, I was the kid that was, you know, I had good parents, but they didn't raise me on like the character of God because they themselves really didn't know him. Uh, we didn't go to church. Um, I actually remember uh, one time going to a youth group on a Wednesday night because a friend of mine invited me to go and I got to the youth group. It was probably a smaller youth group, around like 20 people. Uh, we all had to sit in a circle and uh, we had to read out of the Bible and I never even opened the Bible before. And the youth pastor knew that I was new and that I was a visitor and that um, knew my situation at home and actually called on me to read out of the book of Romans <laughs> of all books. I still remember it and I didn't even know where it was. And this was like my first introduction to like Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I remember feeling so embarrassed and just so like called out and like the guilt and the shame of like the sin in my life I felt was like exposed. Um, just simply because I didn't know like where a book was in the Bible to read from and I never went back to church. It scarred me. So I just began, um, I was in the party scene in high school. I, was, I lived for the weekends for every Friday and Saturday. Um, I danced, I was really involved in school. I made straight A's. I mean, people probably looked at me and thought I was a good kid and that, you know, maybe I even knew Jesus. Um, but I was on the dance team and I played softball and I was very busy, I had a busy lifestyle. Uh, but it just like spun this cycle of like, just partying and just drugs and alcohol and like different things were being introduced to me like you know I lost my virginity when I was 15 and I feel like the reason why I gave that to that person was because I didn't understand my true value because um, if you don't know Jesus you don't know that you're worth anything um, and it was just what all the kids were doing and so I just kind of fell into that you know cycle um, I went on to college still like heavy drinking. Um, I actually worked for Hooters, which is like a restaurant that like promotes like just, you know, just girls to be exposed and to like be desirable and to like get the attention of men. Um, and I worked with them and just felt empty and felt like I was made for more. Uh, 
than just money. You know, I only worked there honestly for money. It wasn't as much for the attention as it was quick money. I just uh, thought that that was what I, you know I was supposed to do is be materialistic and have like nice things and designer name brands and you know that job allowed me to get those things. Um, and then I was 19 years old and a friend of mine got invited me to go to this ministry one night and I went and it was a Tuesday night and I remember go walking in and everyone was worshiping. It was during worship and everyone's eyes were closed and I was, I really didn't understand uh, church or ch church culture. Um, but I knew these kids that were my age, that were in college, they were feeling something. Like there was something real there. Um, I remember walking to the back corner of the room and just sitting there and watching them. And I remember speaking like just in my heart, like, God, if you're real, like, show yourself to me. And immediately I had an encounter with the Lord. He spoke to me. I heard his voice. And he said, you, used to, you thought you could dance before, but you've never danced with me. And that was my, in, my invitation to salvation. It was simply something that I love to do was dance. I love to dance. And the Lord knew that about me. And he spoke that to me. And it was so personal. And immediately from that day on, like just an encounter, I was with him, you know. And I told him, <laughs> my, my prayer to him was, if you can clean my life up, Lord, if you can use me, I'm yours. And I'm yours forever. And I've never looked back. All right, guys, don't forget to visit us online, therevolutiontv.com. There you're going to find full episodes of The Revolution, your favorite bands. You're going to find a link to our Facebook. Reach out to us. Remember, you're not alone. TheRevolutionTV.com Anything is possible with God, especially if He is Lord of your life and you are believing for your soulmate. And I am a sucker for a good love story. So we are about to get into that. Meet Maddie and Candace Montgomery. They weren't set up just by any old friend. They were set up by... God Almighty Himself. This is outrageous, guys. And it reminded me of our story. Oh. It started with a lost ring and God's audible voice. With God, anything is possible. How did we meet? Um, we were on tour, actually, with the band. And uh, we, we had driven overnight the night before to a city called McCalla, Alabama, to this venue called uh, The Fish. And um, we got there at, at, at like nine in the morning and everybody else went to sleep and, um, and slept until like one or two in the afternoon. I slept until about 11. And, uh, and I got up, it was December 15th. And, uh, and it was still uh, like, it was like 65 degrees outside. So me being from the Midwest, I was like, this is awesome. Uh, I'm gonna just go hang out outside. And I was outside reading the scripture, like worshiping, praying to spend the time with the Lord. And while I was out there, I found this ring on the ground. Um, and it was, it was pretty actually, it was, it was kind of a nice ring. And I picked it up and just stuck it in my pocket just cause I thought it was, it was too nice to just throw away, you know? And uh, didn't think twice about it. We, um, you know, we went out to dinner with some of the other bands, loaded all of our stuff in, played our show, didn't cross my mind again and, and until the end of the night uh, when I was standing behind our, uh, our merchandise table and, um, and I just stuck my hand in my pocket just because I do that, and, uh, and, and felt that ring again, and I pulled it out of my pocket just as these two girls walked up to the table, and the first one that I looked at, it was like, God was like, no, there was just a big stop sign over her face, don't do, don't give it to her. <laughs> um, I found out later that she was married, so it would have been awkward for everybody. So I turned to the second girl and I go, here, this is for you. And she's like, oh, thanks, funny, and put it on, and it fit, and we were like, haha, we're supposed to get married. Um, and that, that was Candace. Uh, so we just started talking. I thought she was 16 and was going to be like, cool, the guy from the band gave me a ring, and that would be the end of it. Um, but I was like, who are you here to see? And she said, we just came to see, we just came to tell girls about Jesus. And, uh, and I was like, oh, really? That's huh, you're cool. Uh, and so we just started talking, thinking we were going to be, you know, a cool brother and sister in Christ. And uh, about a week later in, in my private time in prayer, the Lord was like, do you remember that girl, Candace? You're going to marry her. Make sure you keep talking to her. And I said, are you sure? For three days, 
probably a hundred times I was like really because I'm not trying to call this girl and tell her that and then six months from now find out that she is like a crazy person and uh, and he was like really it's okay um, so I did and she said uh, I, I don't know I need to pray about that <laughs> which is which is the right answer I think um, and uh, and she started praying about it and the Lord gave her a dream in which she was walking down the aisle and, and all the faces of the people at the wedding were blurry but she could see my face waiting for her at the end of the aisle. I think that it speaks louder for someone to invest in to invest in the relationships that are closest to them before they invest in relationships that are that are removed, meaning, um, you know, I can stand on stage and be one person in front of a room of 5,000 people, but, um, but a real man of integrity will be the same radical, godly, prophetic, passionate person when they're changing a diaper at 3 in the morning, or, right, or, or when it's like a Tuesday night and their wife doesn't feel good and she needs to get her back around. Like, that's, this is, this is the sort of things I think that, um, that the Lord has been impressing on my heart is just that uh, if I can be godly when everybody's thanking me for it and everyone's admiring me for it and looking up to me for it, then I need to make, make it a priority to be godly in, in private. Um, because to be real, this is not this is not how things came about in in my life, but um, I think that this is the the general tendency for a lot of people, uh, and that is that our our integrity and our faithfulness in secret sets the the standard and the the platform for what we do in in public. I'm starting to see the need to both be a spiritual father and, and also um, to teach those under me to, to be spiritual fathers as well. Uh, you know, I've, I've seen um I've, I've seen people's willingness to follow hit a wall when the, the demand gets placed on them to become a leader. Um, and I, you know, I see a lot of people saying, well, this guy's a really good speaker. He's, you know, he's, he's like charismatic and dynamic and, and he can really get people excited. I'm willing to follow him. But then when, when people look to them and say, it's your turn to lead, then they're suddenly like, no, I'm not qualified. I can't do it. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, I feel like it's it's oftentimes the same excuses that Moses had when the Lord told him that he was going to be the one to lead the Egypt or the Israelites out of Egypt. Um, you know that he would say, "Well, you know, there are other people that are more qualified than me. I'm not a good speaker. Everybody knows that I killed that guy, right? So I have this reputation that is keeping me from being effective in this role of leadership that you're calling me to. But God is saying, if I'm calling you to it, which I am, I'm going to equip you for it. And uh, you know, and, and so I see in my life that it's, it's strategically such a more effective thing to do to raise up leaders because, you know, if, if I send leaders out into schools and local churches and local music scenes and, um, you know, local communities, then I don't have to go out to those schools and churches and scenes and communities. Explain what a leader is. Okay, a leader being someone that through their lifestyle sets and raises the standard of what it is to follow Christ. And, you know, oftentimes I think um, that involves an aspect of, of teaching, that involves an aspect of prophecy, it involves an aspect of evangelism, but, but all of those things, I think, combined are this thing that we call leadership or spiritual fatherhood that people would say, you know, I'm willing to take on the role of um, the, the shepherd. I'll, I'll say this is where we're going and I believe that this is where God is leading us and if you guys would follow me I'm also going to I'm also gonna fight for you to defend you to make sure that you can come with me. Um, I had a man say to me that he had a vision of, of spiritual uh, fatherhood um, that it, it was a man standing with a shepherd's crook in one hand and a sword in the other. That he was a man that was willing to lead with tenderness and patience and mercy but he was also a man that was willing to fight uh, when, when the moment called for it. And, uh, and, and so, you know, as we're raising people up, that's something that I'm passionate about seeing um, leaders step into, that, that they're people that are, are willing to come alongside people and say, if this is something that you're ignorant on, like, let's go after it together. Let's pursue truth together. I can teach you. We can get into scripture together. Um, you know, but also when those same people are, are struggling with, with perpetual sin or with, with a spirit of, of um, oppression or whatever, uh, those leaders are the people that are, are the ones that are going to show up at your house at three in the morning and, and go to war in the spiritual um, and just begin to like lay hands on you and pray for you and anoint you with oil and just do you know whatever it takes both in the realm of teaching and in the realm of warfare. I feel like as women uh, we desire intimacy and we uh, 
our hearts are designed more for like the nurturing spirit and like the intimate spirit of Jesus um, because we desire to be wanted and loved um, and a lot of times I feel like women who don't necessarily know Jesus go to the world and go to guys and they get in this cycle of finding who is my husband or finding the right man you know to love them like perfectly when really there's one man that can love them perfectly and it's Jesus um, and I feel like like women we uh we carry this spirit of like intercession and um, we were designed for that. We were designed to like come alongside the men as f- and like cover them in prayer and like um, warring in the like secret place. Like God like, like calls women to come to the secret place and to seek him in private and to seek his face and his face alone. Um, because for men they're made for war. And we're made for war too, but it's different. We don't necessarily go out all the time to the battlefield in war on behalf of kids like that. We, we do it in the secret place, which is harder because you do, you're not noticed. You're not on stage preaching. You're not, you know, um, held high in regards to, like, the world. You know, people don't look to you and call you godly because they don't see you in the back room praying. Um, but I feel like that is what we were designed to do. God, I just hear you saying, I just hear you saying, Father, that that there are men that have been waiting for something to qualify them to be radical for you. That they've been waiting for some experience or some encounter or some some tremendous event that would that would suddenly let it click for them. And God, I just ask that they would stop waiting and make up their mind right now in Jesus' name. God, I just declare that men will will choose boldness, will will choose revolutionary, will choose to be revolutionary, that, that they will choose to be passionate for you, that they will choose to burn for you in every moment. God. I just ask that, that no longer will they be waiting for something to qualify them because the death and resurrection of Jesus qualifies them. God, and I just ask that they would choose to receive that and they would choose to receive the life that you've made available to them through that, Father. I just ask God that men would, would, would begin to make war for their city in the secret place, God. That, that long before they ever stand behind a pulpit or hold a, hold a microphone, long before they have thousands of people ever listening to them, that they would choose to burn for you and to make war on behalf of their city, God that they would just come to you in the place of prayer, that they would just, that they would just come to you, God, in, in, in the place of spiritual submission and understanding that, God, if you get into this battle, only victory is to be expected. And so, God, I just ask that men would just contend that you would move on behalf of their city, God, that you would bring freedom and breakthrough on behalf of their city and their church, that you would bring freedom and victory on behalf of their, their family and their friends, God. I just ask in the name of Jesus, Father, that you would just put such an urgency in the heart of the men of our generation to walk in the fullness of everything that you've made available to them, God, that they would never rest day or night until you establish the church as a haven for our generation, until you establish the church as a, as, as a place in which freedom is given freely to those that would come and get it, that until you establish the church as the, the, the exact radiance and the manifestation of God's glory on earth, God. And I believe that that is your heart, that the church would operate in the same facet that Jesus did when he was on earth, that there would be the exact radiance and the representation of your glory in the earth, Father. We just release that on the men, that that their hearts would begin dreaming big again. That they would not operate under the the fear, uh, under under the scars and the wounds that they've received out of past failure, but that they would understand that that in following you in obedience, and following you with with real focus and real determination, there's only victory. There's only success, God. And I just release men to dream again. I release men into unity to fight a alongside each other again. I release men to labor and to strive for the establishment of your kingdom on earth and to begin to believe in faith and expectancy that it would happen. I just declare this over them in Jesus' victorious name. One of my favorite for today's songs is Seraphim and the chorus says, take your flame and ignite the world. It sounds like a war cry, doesn't it? But there's no way that that could happen unless you have Jesus Christ ruling and reigning in your life, asking him to come and be Lord of your life, letting him help decide the big decisions that you will make. That is step one. Step two starts with Acts, the second chapter, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Yes, this is a real thing. 
And you churchgoers out there, I challenge you to dig into the Bible, see what God says about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, because really we have no business saying, take your flame and ignite the world, unless we have our power source on the inside, which is the Holy Spirit because we can have all the zeal and the power mm -hmm. and the huff and puff, but if we don't have the principle, if we don't have Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit living on the inside of us, we're a joke, right? That's right. I mean, God, Paul talked about in his writings that he didn't come with mere words, but with a demonstration of God's power yes. that those would believe. And you know, it's, there's nothing wrong with seeking God to move in a miraculous way. You know, the band was named for today for a reason. They wanted everybody to know that all that stuff that happened in the Bible, it's still for today. Yeah. It's still available now. God mm. is willing to move. We hear stories of miracles happening in third world countries because you know, they don't have a Rite Aid in the corner. They don't have mm. a pharmacy to go to. You know, they don't have a doctor standing in every block. When they need a miracle, they have to have a miracle from God. When they need someone to be healed, they can't just go to the hospital. They need God to show up, and God is showing up. And God wants to show up for you. He wants to show up and demonstrate that He's alive and well right now, that everybody would believe in His Son, that He sent Him, that He sent Him with His power. You know, Jesus said, these signs would follow those that believe. They will cast out demons, they will heal, lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. These signs will follow, and they're starting to follow and follow. Before Christ's return, we're going to see amazing, amazing signs and wonders, just like it said in Joel and in Acts. And you're going to be part of that. So it's time for you guys to rise up. But it starts with having a relationship with Jesus. Oh, yeah. Not religion, not going to church, not saying you're a Christian, but really knowing Christ mm. in your life, making Him the Lord of your life, turning 180 from all that's unrighteous and walking with Him day by day. Amen reach out to us, revolutiontv.com. If you have any questions, reach out to us. We're there, we'll reach right back. We love you guys. If God be for you, who could be against you? Mm -hmm.